We're starting a new series today uh, called A New Way Forward, and today's going to be a little different. Matter of fact, the next few weeks are going to be a little different for us because uh, this is going to be a vision series for us as a church. And what I mean by vision series is it's good every so often for us to come together and talk about uh, where we feel like God is taking us, where we feel like God is, is sending our churches in, into, the, into the future, what that ministry is going to look like, and because I know, and I'm sure you probably know this at heart, that what worked back then doesn't work now. And our church is a product of that. That's why we're not uh, sitting here singing with a hymn and an organ like many of us grew up. Not saying anything specifically wrong with that, but there's always a point in time where we need to say, well, there needs to be a new way forward. That you know, the the message of God's grace doesn't change. The message of Jesus doesn't change, but how we get that message out does change. And so that's what we're starting today. A new way forward. We're talking about a new way forward. And specifically, I want to talk about uh, where we are and where we're going, where we are uh, as a church and where we are as communities, where we are maybe even as a nation a little bit, but specifically here in our neck of the woods and, and where we're going. And so first, let's talk about how things have, have changed. Uh, I think that word, matter of fact, I'm sick of the word change. Because I feel like everything around us has changed. The way we eat has changed. The way we greet people has changed. I don't even hardly even shake hands now. I, I fist bump. Now, I will have to say, though, a little secret. I've always been a germaphobe, and I was a germaphobe before it was cool. But, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, but, but a lot of things have changed. And specifically, uh, the pandemic has certainly changed a lot of things. But what I've noticed is that really, really this, whole, this whole pandemic thing hasn't so much brought about new change is that it has accelerated change that was already happening. You know, there were things that were already set in motion in a lot of areas of our life. Now, there's going to be things that we're going to get back to, certainly. And, and I hope, I hope, hint, hint, I hope that attending church in person is going to be one of those for those of you who are, who are comfortable sitting at home, who don't have a good reason to be at home. Hint, hint, maybe you should come on back in. We miss you. But a lot of things have changed, but specifically in our church, what has changed, obviously, is is attendance. A lot of us, obviously, for, for, well, for a long time, many churches, us included, didn't have any physical locations. We were only online, and now even our online audience has grown. I mean, it. I don't mind hiding, hiding these things, but we have more people watching us online on a weekly basis than we do in person, and that's okay. I think we will continue to be a, a hybrid church, both online and in person, but that has changed. Uh, uh, one of the things that have changed for us is being uncomfortable with maybe people outside of our bubble, you know, maybe being in large spaces. There's just a lot of stuff that has changed, but, but specifically things that have been changed and have been accelerated, maybe how we shop, our viewing habits. Y'all remember Blockbuster, right? Y'all remember the joy of Blockbuster on a Friday afternoon? Walking through there, man, I miss Blockbuster. Golly, I'm feeling all sentimental now. My kids will never get to experience trying to find your favorite movie only to realize that they were all out. And then finding another movie that was your second favorite and then getting a big tub of popcorn because got Blockbuster popcorn was so good. Well, one of the things that has changed in our culture that is really, again, it's bigger than us, it's bigger than our town, uh, a Gallup poll in 2020 showed this, that in 2020, 47% of U.S. adults, only 47% of U.S. adults belong to a church, synagogue, or mosque. So that wasn't specifically for Christianity. That was just looking at people who attended religious services. So in the first time in our nation's history, less than 50% of people were regularly going to a, a, a religious gathering of sorts. And I think we need to take that into, into consideration as we're thinking forward is that we're living in, in a sense, in many cases, a post-Christian reality, a post-religious reality. Now, what's interesting, this is really fascinating, is that the younger generations are not less spiritual, but they want to have less to do with organized religions. There's a whole host of reasons. We're not going to go into all of that stuff today. But the fact is, you just need to know that right now in America, there are less people going to church than ever in any time in our country's history. Now, again, America is not the end all be all. Christianity existed long before America did. But that is something that we need to take in and we need to understand that right now we're not we're not trying to worry about people, you know, going to other churches. The fact is a lot of people just aren't going to church. And again, the pandemic accelerated that change. But here's something that never changes. What never changes is our need for the life changing power of the gospel of Jesus. 
So it doesn't matter where church attendance numbers are. It doesn't matter. And listen, I'm not trying to be negative or, or despondent or man like, oh, man, I'm really going to be depressed. No, listen, I am less disappointed and less depressed because, listen here, do you know what the recipe for revival is? The need for reviving. That's where it begins. It's often when the, a fall away happens that God begins to pour out his spirit, but it takes a hungry few. And so we need to remember that one thing that doesn't change, it doesn't matter if your neighbors aren't going to church, your coker workers aren't going to church, your doggo kids aren't going to church. People need the life-changing power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. That will never change until Jesus comes back. Y'all get me? That will never, ever change. So throughout history of the throughout really the, the church history, um, the Christian church has always leveraged all sorts of tools at its disposal. I mean, we look back uh, all the way to the disciples, to the earliest days of Christianity after Jesus ascended into heaven. And, you know, the disciples were some of the very first ones to really start uh, passing around this kind of form of storytelling called a narrative. Actually, the Bible is one of the first kind of biographical narratives in the ancient world. That, that art form, that literature type didn't exist, how we read in the Gospels. So in a sense, they invented, long before it was popular, a, a style of writing. Uh, then you, you know, we use the Roman roads. Christianity expanded because of the Roman Empire and its access. You see that in the ministries of Paul. And then pressing forward several hundred years, the printing press. That was one of the first books to be printed on the printing press. Anybody, anybody know? It's the Bible, the Gutenberg Bible. That's why you probably heard that before. The printing press brought about a revolution in people's having access to the Word of God in a way that they could understand. That's where Bible translations in the common language came from. And of course, now we live in a time where it's audio, video technology. That's why we use screens. That's why we use the internet. Internet is the highway of our age. And so we're constantly using and leveraging any form or fashion to get that message, that unchanging message of the grace and the gospel of Jesus Christ out to people. But let's talk about kind of how our church has gotten here. Over the last 25 years, that's how old we are. We celebrated that last year, 25th year anniversary at Cornerstone. And Cornerstone was planted out of this desire, out of this need to build what we were considered a, a life-giving, a relevant, a contemporary church model. And, and some of you have been here since the beginning. Maybe some of you have jumped in or just been going to Bamberg for only a couple years. But our church model is considered the contemporary church church movement. A lot of churches similar to us kind of started within the last 25 or 30 years, and they were all in an effort to build a church that felt less foreign than maybe some of your more traditional churches, that felt honestly less dated than some of your more traditional churches. Again, not talking against, just talking plain facts. And so out of that, the, the contemporary church movement like us you know, it brought in, you know, the aspects of a live band and, and more relevant contemporary teaching and preaching and, and all sorts of different stuff like that, using technology to our advantage, all of those kinds of things. And back then, there was a common assumption. And the common assumption was this, that people wanted to go to church. They just wanted to go to a church that was, frankly, a little less boring. Some of y'all can remember, I mean, let's be honest. You know, you can remember sitting on your mommy and daddy's lap. I can when I was a kid, having to sit there and hear a pastor preach for 45 minutes, and it just wasn't anything super interesting. It was the same over and over and over again. And, you know, it was always Aunt Lou, somebody who would sing the song, and Aunt Lou could never really sing, but nobody seemed to tell her. And, you know, th those kind of church experiences. So, you know, we had the assumption when we planted this church that there were a group of people that wanted something better wanted something more relevant, that wanted their kids to experience something new and fresh and exciting. So that's why we built a kids' ministry like we do. That's why we have student ministries and, and other ministries like we do here. The problem is that assumption has to change because we were assuming there was something called seekers. We're called a seeker-sensitive church, people who are seeking a place to go, but the fact is there are far less seekers today. I can remember thinking that, man, there were people waking up every morning, every Sunday morning, wondering where to go to church and, and hoping they would decide us. And, and now the, the reality is a lot of people are waking up and just deciding not to go to church. 
Or if they are, they're just tuning into maybe some online broadcast, which again, that's why we put this stuff out there and it is useful, but it's still not quite the same thing of being in the room. Our, our faith is something that is supposed to be relational and personal and collective together, if possible. See, this change isn't a surprise though, because again, the pandemic, it didn't force something that wasn't already happening. You know, we had begun to see these trends several years ago. This isn't a, a big shock to us. We didn't wake up one day, you know, the first, you know, three or four weeks of the pandemic and go, oh my gosh, everything's changing so fast. Like, we knew that these changes were coming. The problem is they came much faster. Uh, in my mind, in a lot of our minds, we were thinking that we had the next five to 10 years to kind of brace for this change that was coming where people didn't want to be regular attenders all the time. And so, Back then, we had a mission statement that said this, you know, that our church, Cornerstone, we exist for the purpose of helping people find, follow, and be like Jesus. You've probably heard that before. You've probably seen it somewhere. That's, that's been our mission statement for a good while now, that, that this, corner, this church exists to help people to find Jesus, to follow Jesus, and to eventually to learn to be like Jesus. And then a few years ago, because we saw this change coming and we can feel this tension we decided it was time that we needed to specifically state what kind of people, because when I say helping people, well, what kind of people? Well, all sorts of people, and that's how it used to be because we assumed that there were just a whole host of, of different and seeker, seeker people out there that were going to want to be coming, but we felt the need to, to, to distill that down, and so we came up with this. There's only one little word change. It's helping disconnected people, helping disconnected people find, follow, and be like Jesus. So we added disconnected because we felt like there were going to be a group of people, there would be a lot of people that genuinely felt disconnected. And they were going to be disconnected from, from two different things. They were going to be disconnected, one from God. And the fact is, we probably all experienced that on some hand where we felt disconnected from God, where we felt like, man, God seems so far away, but then also we want to try to connect the disconnected to others. Because see, our, our faith our belief system isn't just about between us and God, it's between us and others. What did, what did Jesus say? The greatest commandment, love the Lord God with all your heart and love others as yourself. So, so we know that people can be disconnected from God and can be disconnected from each other. And here's the reason why disconnect is so important. Because you're thinking, well, wait a second, wait a second. Some of you critical thinkers. Don't we live in the most connected time in history? Aren't we like more connected now than ever? Like we have these boxes in our pockets that all they ever do is connect us? Yes, but study after study after study shows that in this world, people are more lonely, more disconnected, specifically from their neighbor, more isolated. Uh, the fact of the matter is suicide is at an all-time high when things should look around and we say, man, things are getting better. In reality, things are not any better. And so I really believe with all my heart that even though we're connected, we're plugged in, we're not really connected. We are disconnected. We're, we're falling into smaller and smaller bubbles of like-mindedness, like faultness, just likeness. And that's not healthy, but ultimately we just begin to pull away from other people. The fact is, in today's culture, we're learning or we're, we're un unlearning how to disagree with someone and still love them. Why? Because we're disconnected. So I feel like that word is, is very telling and very important. And you need to know that it's just as, as our church family that when we use this word, that's what I'm referring to. So now our mission, our mission is a retelling, to get back to that, a retelling of, of what is called the Great Commission, the Great Commission. This is what the Great Commission is. This comes from Jesus right before he ascended into heaven when he was charging his first followers uh, what to do next. And it starts in Matthew 28, verse 18. And it says, Jesus came near to them and said, listen, guys, all authority, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. He means that I'm in charge now. The evil regimes, the wicked regimes, you know, the, of death and of decay and of destruction and of the enemy. He is no longer in charge. I'm in charge. But we live in an already but not yet reality. There's a tension there that we're supposed to go out. He says, so, because I'm in charge now, he says, go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit teaching them to observe everything I have commanded you. And remember, 
I am with you always to the end of the age. And so there we sit. We still sit in this reality. This is the last command that Jesus gave his followers while he was here on earth. And that's something that we need to take seriously. And so our mission statement to help disconnected people find, follow, and be like Jesus is kind of a, a distilling of that into wordage and language that we can leverage for our community. Because people are disconnected. They're disconnected from the source of life. They're disconnected from purpose, from true love, because you can't really know what love is if you're not connected with the source of love. They're disconnected from true friendship. They're disconnected from God's forgiveness and grace. So it's no wonder that our world is so broken. And it's because people are so disconnected from the author and the source of of life. See, see, Paul writes in Ephesians, this is how he explains our condition. He says, listen, it says, and you were dead. All of you who now believe in Jesus Christ, you were dead too in your trespass and sin in which you previously walked according to the ways of the world, according to the ruler of the powers of the air, talking about the enemy against us and, and the spirit now working in the disobedience. He says, listen, you were locked in. You were basically chained to the bottom of a pool of your own sin, but because you became connected with the source of life, freedom, and forgiveness, you now are alive. And that is our mission, to go and bring people back to life, to bring their hearts and their souls, to bring back people's humanity because you can't be truly human unless you're living with the creator of humans. So that's our job. So how are we going to do that? Because the thing about a mission statement is it tells us what to do, what to do. We are to help disconnected people find, follow, and be like Jesus, but it doesn't tell us how. And matter of fact, if you look at the Great Commission, um, Jesus doesn't specifically tell us how he says, go, baptize, teach, but it doesn't tell us how. He didn't say, and so when you're teaching, make sure you do Sunday school, or when you're teaching, make sure you do small group, or when you're teaching, make sure you speak in this language or that language. All of that is open for interpretation because it needs to be. And so the challenge for us as a local church is to figure out, Father, how are we, how are we to reach our disconnected neighbors? How are we to reach our disconnected coworkers, our disconnected family, and our disconnected children? How are we to do that? And so over, over time of, of really seeking the Lord together as a staff, uh, personally as, as, as a pastor, I feel like the, word, the Lord has given us three words, uh, kind of a three-word vision of how we're supposed to go about this. And this is, this is something that's going to begin to kind of revolutionize the ministry workings of our church, both here in Orangeburg and Bamberg, how we present ourselves online in the future. All of these things are going to point the way of how. We know what, help disconnect people, find, follow, and be like Jesus, but how. And those three words are this, that we are to connect, that we are to care, and that we are to cultivate, that we are to connect, that we are to care, and that we are to cultivate. That is going to be our how. How are we going to help disconnected people? We're going to start by connecting with them. It starts with connecting. How do you reach disconnected people? You connect with them. You pursue them. You share your life with them. And so we've attached this sentence to this idea, this word connect, that I think kind of helps us flush this out in our mind, and it's this, that we are to actively connect people to God and others, that we actively connect people of God and others because see here's what I I know about our church method up until now is that basically we, we 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 opened up shop we came here on Sunday mornings we opened up our doors we unlocked everything we turned on the air conditioner or the heater and we turned the lights on and we said hey everybody come come and see come and see but see that that is changing because we can shout from the rooftops come and see come and see and there are no more seekers and so what the church is going to have to do is start to change to where we become pursuers, where we chase after people, where we go after people, where, listen, where we pray individually and collectively, say, God, who do I need to connect with today? Who do I need to stand in the gap for today? Lord, who at my job, who in my family, what of my friends, what stranger do I need to connect with today? Because the fact is, is, it's less and less people desire to go to church. What that means is, is that more responsibility falls on us as individuals. It falls on you. It falls on all of us, not just me. It's on all of us to do our job that, 
that when we're in Walmart and the Lord puts a, a burden on our heart to talk to that cashier or that person in front of us or behind us in line. Or, and I'm not saying to always say like, well, hey, you happen to be standing in front of me in line. Have you heard about the message of Jesus Christ? I mean, maybe that's appropriate sometimes, but sometimes maybe it's just being kind. It's connecting people. Because listen, how can I say that we're to connect people to, to God and others? It's because the Spirit of God is in you. This building has never been church. That's probably the part of the problem. We're like, let's build a big building and fill it full of cool stuff and people will come. And at one time, that actually worked, but not anymore. I mean, I could put the coolest stuff up here on the stage. I could build the coolest set pieces up here and I could get up here, scream and shout all I wanted to. But listen, if we're not connecting with people outside the walls, they're never gonna know. I need you to think about this. You, your life, is a walking billboard for Jesus Christ. You are a representation of new life on this planet. And I'm not saying you need to wear a big, I love Jesus shirt, and I'm probably going to discourage you from putting a Jesus fish on your car because some of you don't represent Jesus well when you drive, to be honest. But I am saying that in your interactions, in your conversations with people, especially people who don't know God, we are to be the connectors. We are to actively connect people to God and to others. We're supposed to be the bridge. Don't you see that Jesus became the bridge for us so that we could connect with God and now that we're to be the bridge? That's our charge. Go, therefore, make disciples, baptize them, and teach them all that I have commanded you. So first we have connect. Now, here's the problem. And connect is very important and it must come first. It must come first as you'll see in a second. But see, connecting takes a few things. It takes time, it takes purpose, and it takes strategy. Connecting takes time, purpose, and strategy. You know the reason, personally, I'll just be honest with you, why I often don't want to connect with people because I don't feel like I have the time. I don't want to, I don't want to have the time to be frank, sometimes. I'm just busy. I'm in a hurry. I have been guilty, don't judge me, of putting headphones on and going into Walmart hoping nobody would talk to me. Because sometimes you just feel like, let me just exist, man. And I, and I get it. I'm not saying that every single time you know, you, you're walking, but I'm telling you, are you living on purpose? Because you are here for a purpose. So connection takes time, purpose, and strategy. So the second step then goes to care. So we have connect, then we have care. And the, uh, the, the statement associated with care is this, that we compassionately care for all God sends us, that we compassionately care for all God sends us. This is the key word. The reason we say care for all God sends us is because I know for myself and I know for church world, and I know for a lot of us, we only wanna care for those that we choose. Not the ones that God sends us, we just wanna care for the ones that we choose. We want to care for the ones that honestly bring us gain or bring us fame, right? You know, I want to help the people who are popular on, on, on social media so maybe they'll post about me, right? They'll post about how good I am. Or I want to care for somebody who I know can help me in the future. Like, oh, they have, they have money. They have prestige. They have renown. If I help them out, they'll look out for me. But did you know Oftentimes, God will call you to help somebody, to care for somebody who can't help you at all. And you know what? When you do that, that is when you're most like Christ. Because who are we that the creator of the world would do so much to save a rebellious, stiff-necked people like you and me? But oh, the care of the Father, that he would send his one and only Son that whosoever believed in him could call on that son's name, could look upon his cross and say, I want to stand with him in those sufferings and I believe in his message of salvation and I want to receive that mercy and that father would care enough to say yes. That's our God. And as his people, we should be people that are known, that are renowned for our care. And here's the, here's the thing that I think is going to be challenging in the future. Is that 
in times past, how can I put this to be blunt? In times past, we could consider more people to be Christ followers, I think, in a way, because that's what culture was. We can go back a few generations, and the fact is back then you would just assume that people were Christians. And so one bad or a few bad examples of Christianity really didn't override the overwhelming majority that were, I think, probably good Christians back then. Not all, but some, most. Well, today we have to remember that many people don't want to claim faith. They don't want to stick to anything. We live in a rebellious generation. We live in a disconnected generation. So we now more than ever must bear the responsibility of our calling individually and collectively. That you as a Christian can't just look to us as church leadership and say, well, what are they doing? It should be, well, what am I doing first? How am I caring for people? What am I doing to impact the kingdom of God around me? See, the old adage about care, which is so true, says this, you know, no one knows, no one cares how much you know. No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. And I think that's a good example of Christianity in the past. We've always wanted to tell people, we got to tell you the right thing. Let me tell you what you're doing wrong. I don't really care about your life. I don't want to get messy in your life, but I'd love to tell you what you're doing wrong. Well, you know what? No one cares how much you know until they know how much you care. Because listen, you watch, look at, read the Gospels. Often before Jesus taught or before he reprimanded, what would he do? He would serve. He would heal He would care for people. God demonstrates that all throughout Scripture. I could go from story to story to story to story. We don't have time for that today. We're going to talk about that another day. But caring caring for those, we need to care for those who are hurting, who are struggling alone, who are disconnected. These people who are disconnected, they're they're suffering alone. There's so many people, guys, they're, they're dying alone in hopelessness. Where's the church? Where are we? Where are we? Where are you? And the world needs you. The kingdom of God needs you. I, he needs you, teenager. He needs you, college student. He needs you, young adult. He needs you, sir, who's wrapped up in your career. He needs you, ma'am. He, he needs all of you. The kingdom of God needs you to connect, to care, and lastly, to cultivate. To cultivate. And the statement with cultivation is this, that we creatively help people cultivate a deeper relationship with God and his people. So again, I hope you all are seeing this, this, this idea where we're helping disconnected people find, follow, and be like Jesus. And then it's this God and others, God and others, God and others. So we creatively help people cultivate a deeper relationship with both God and with others. So the reason that we chose cultivate, because typically in this statement, we would use a word called discipleship. So we're called to discipleship as a church, right? And the problem is, when I say the word discipleship, depending on your church background and the amount of time that you went to church, you probably have a pretty strong idea of what discipleship is. Maybe it's a class. Maybe it's some kind of seminar. Maybe it's going out and doing something. I don't know. There's all sorts of versions of discipleship. I'm not saying any of those are wrong, but I I didn't want to use a term that was really uh, already heavy burdened with meaning. And so cultivate uh, brings into image, at least in my mind, the idea of a garden. And so, so how do you plant a garden? How do you get something to grow in a garden? Well, first, you've got to prepare the ground. I mean, you just don't go out into your yard and just start throwing seed out and going like, man, this is going to work out great, right? This is going to be so successful. No, you've got to prepare the ground first. You've got to till it up. You've got to break it up. You've got to get all the weeds and stuff out of it. You've got to make it good for planting, good soil, And then you got to plant. You can do all the tilling and stand there for ages and go, so when does the corn grow? Well, you got to put it in the ground first. You got to put the seed in the ground. You got to plant it. Then you got to water it. You got to wait. You got to tend to it. You got to protect it from the birds and from storms and from runoff and all of these things like that. Then you got to weed it because sometimes weeds can overtake a garden literally and figuratively. Weeds can choke out the message of the gospel in a person's heart. And then lastly, you harvest. All of those things first, and then comes the harvest. Most of us is like, it's time for discipleship, time to harvest. And like, we ain't done no work yet. We ain't put no effort in yet. We cultivate people. We don't just find people and say, here's what you gotta do. Send you on your way. Good luck out there. It's a tough world. No, man, we, we, we connect with people. We get to know them. We get to know their struggles. We care for them. 
in compassionate and unique ways. And then we creatively cultivate each other, new people, broken people. We help nurture them. We help grow. I want you to even think of cultivation whenever you hear that word, almost even like a tree. I don't know if you've ever seen this within like herbology or anything like that, but, but within a tree, as a tree grows, if it gets begin to grow in the wrong place, uh, somebody will, will come and grab it and, and they'll put a stake in the ground. They'll rewrite the tree. Cultivation is what you do for your children. You don't just like wake up one day like, all right, you just got to guess it again today, kid. You know, I, can, I don't have anything to offer you. No, when you see a kid going off course, you begin to slowly correct them. That's what cultivation means. So we have connect, we have care, and we have cultivate. We have the C3 vision of Cornerstone Church. And over the next two weeks, we're going to spend a good bit of time on these and how we plan on implementing them in the church, what that looks like, how we need you to help. But before I get there, to kind of wrap this up, I'm, I'm almost finished. I want to turn us for just a second. I want to turn us to something because it can be overwhelming, I think. I can feel pretty overwhelmed sometimes. Uh, not necessarily with the vision, but I can feel pretty overwhelmed with the state of the world. I can feel pretty overwhelmed basically anytime I read the news. I can feel panicked about, honestly, the world of which my children are being raised in. I just feel overwhelmed. I can feel like it's all out of my control. And the fact is, it is out of my control. I can feel like my own life is out of my control. And the fact is, oftentimes it is. So I want to read you something from 1 Peter. 1 Peter, obviously, the Apostle Peter, one of the very first disciples that Jesus called. Peter has a colored history, you know. When you read the Gospels, Peter is not a, not a perfect dude. He was exactly the kind that God loves to use, you know. And over the years... Christ cultivated Peter during his earthly ministry and Peter turns out to be one of the largest and most influential leaders of the Christian church, to be honest. So he pens a letter later in his life and he's writing it to a group of Christians. And I want to get this to you, a group of Christians just like us, a group of Christians that never got to see Jesus in the flesh, a group of Christians that were shared the gospel with that decided to receive it and believe it. So, he, so this is what he says. I'm going to read just a few verses to you. He says, starting in verse 3, he says, All praise to God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. It is by his great mercy that we have been born again, because God raised Jesus Christ from the dead. Now we live with great expectation. We're excited. And we have a priceless inheritance. An inheritance that is kept in heaven for you, pure and undefiled, beyond the reach of change and decay. And through your faith, God is protecting you by his power until you receive this salvation, which is ready to be revealed in the last day for all to see. Verse 6. He says, so be truly glad. There's wonderful joy ahead. Don't be, don't be disappointed. Don't be frustrated and overwhelmed. Because even though you must endure many trials for a little while, there will be hardships. See, these trials, they show that your faith is genuine. It is being tested as fire tests and purifies gold. Though your faith is more precious, far more precious than gold. So when your faith remains strong through its many trials, it will bring you much praise and glory and honor on the day when Christ Jesus revealed to the whole world. Keep going. Press on. Don't give up. See, you love him even though you have never seen him. That's us. Though you do not see him now, you must trust him. And you must rejoice with a glorious and expressible joy. You must choose this joy. The reward for trusting him will be the salvation of your souls. And see, this salvation was something even the prophets wanted to know more about when they prophesied that for generations after generations, they prophesied about the Messiah, about this gracious salvation prepared for you, for you and I. The one, they wondered what time or what situation the Spirit of Christ within them was talking about when he told them in advance about Christ's sufferings and his great glory afterwards. See, they were told that their message was not for themselves. 
It was for you. It was for me. It was for us. The whole Old Testament, that story, it's for us. And now, this good news, this gospel, has, has been announced to you by those who preached in the power of the Holy Spirit sent from heaven. See, it is so wonderful. This is a great line. It is so wonderful that even the angels are eagerly watching these things happen. That don't you get it? That when you take part in the mission of Jesus Christ, that when you connect, care, and cultivate people in your life, that the angels are watching in awe. That you're not alone in this struggle. That when you're suffering on behalf of Jesus Christ and you put your faith in the Lord, that when you're joyful, even in a situation of despair, that the angels look at you and they're impressed. That's the power of the gospel in our life. So don't you dare give up. Because here's some things that I know. Matter of fact, here's some things that we should all know to be true that Peter's talking about here. What we know to be true is one, God is faithful. God is faithful. He is faithful, he is faithful, he is faithful. His faithfulness will always endure. We know that the Spirit empowers, that he is still empowering believers just like in the beginning of the church. That Listen, you might be afraid to step out, but I want you to know that the Spirit will empower you to say, to do, to go, to have faith, to have courage. You just need to ask. What we know to be true is that the church will endure. I do not think that the Christian church's best days are behind it. And if that is in your mind, you take that and you submit it to the authority of Jesus Christ right now in your mind. I don't care if there are less people in this country because one, the gospel is spreading like fire in other parts of the world. That is a fact. Places like China, places where communism and other horrible dictatorships are in, places like South America where there's poverty and disease, they believe with such a pure faith. The problem in our country, honestly, is that we are all so stinking comfortable. We're all a bunch of comfortable Christians that we think that God is against us when somebody's driving slower than us in traffic. And the fact is, that's sad. But I believe that the church will endure. I believe that God, I believe that God is going to do great things in our midst. I believe that God is going to do powerful things through this church, through you, Bamberg. I believe that God has chosen us for this appointed time, that he, is, that he chose the early church for that season, that we are now for this season. God is calling you for now. I'm trying to quit worrying about my kids because God has brought them on this planet for such a time as this, and he's done the same for you. For such a time as this, God wants to use you now. I believe that the local church is the hope of the world. I believe with all my heart. I believe when we see hopelessness, when we see brokenness, it's our job, it's the church's job to stand up strong and say, not on my watch, not on my watch. I'm gonna care. I'm gonna care for people. I'm gonna love people. I'm gonna love people that I even disagree with. I'm not gonna hate people. I'm going to love them into the kingdom of God. Peter says later in his letter, he says, see, you, you yourselves, you are, you are living stones. You're a spiritual house. You are being built to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Christ Jesus. That is every single one of you. That is all of us. And lastly, I will leave you with this. I believe that God is looking for a group of people to pour his spirit out on. See, scripture tells us that the Lord's eyes wander to and fro over the world looking for someone whose hearts is his. And over time, there have been those people. There's been David, there's been Moses, there's been the disciples, there's been all the great people in scripture. And I, can, I believe it could be us too. Will it be you, I wonder? Will it be me? Will we do what it takes? Will we be humble enough? Will we be eager enough? Will we seek the Lord with perseverance enough? Will we discipline ourselves enough? So I guess really that's my question. Are you willing? Are you willing to go with me? Because I'm going to be honest with you. God has put this on my heart, and I feel like it's burning me from the inside out. 
guys, I'm driven and I'm excited as, 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 your, one of your, as one of your pastors, one of your leaders here. But I cannot do it alone. But I will go as far as I can. But I need you. So are you willing? Are you willing to go with me? Are you willing to go with this church? Are you willing to connect, care, and cultivate people in your circle? Are you willing to go out of your way and be uncomfortable? Are you willing to invite? Are you willing to invest? Are you willing to share your life? Or are you going to live small? I'm going to say the choice is yours. The choice is all of ours. Every single day, we need to make that choice. Are you willing? Bamberg, are you willing to go the distance for your families, for your children's, for the generations after you, for your neighbors, for your community? Are you willing, Bamberg? I'm so glad that you guys decided to join us online uh, at this time, I'm going to go ahead and turn you guys back over to, uh, to one of your leaders there. I love you guys just so much. So proud of y'all, proud of your leadership. And I can't wait to see what God is going to do in you guys in this next season as we all together find a new way forward. See you, Van Burden. And so if everybody else online, I want to challenge you that. You sitting at your home, sitting maybe riding in your car, listening to this at a later date. Are you willing? Are you willing to go with me? Are you willing to go together as a church? I'm not even asking you so much to follow me, but I, but I need you to lock arms with me as we walk forward into this, as we connect, as we care, as we cultivate, as we help disconnected people find, follow, and be like Jesus. We try to transform our community here. When you see a problem in Orangeburg, I need you to say not that that's broken or that's just Orangeburg or that's just how things are around here in today's world. No, how can I be of assistance, Lord? What do I need to do today, Lord? How can you use me right now, Lord? How can I be you in this situation, Lord? Because I believe that the Spirit is still enabling people and His eyes are searching. So I pray, Lord, that it stops on you and me. So with that in mind, let's go to the Lord in prayer as we close out today. Father, our great Father, our leader, Lord, I thank you for purpose. I thank you for mission. Lord, every day that we have breath, you have set us out on mission for your kingdom. And Lord, I pray that starting today, every single one of us, Lord, when we pray, your kingdom come and your will be done, let it be with a new conviction in our heart, a new, a new attitude in our mind, Lord, that we are excited, that we're clear. Lord, bring clarity in our minds of what is in front of us and what needs to be done. Let us not set it off onto somebody else and expect it to be somebody else's responsibility. We are the responsibility bearers. That when we see brokenness and decay that sin has caused, or we are the one to step into the gap, to pray for people, to love people, to seek you on behalf of them, to ask you what to say to them. How can we intervene in their life, Lord? Let us, let us be praying for our children and set up a new generation to love you, Lord, like days of old, Lord, not even in, in this country, just in days of old, Lord, when your spirit was poured out in a powerful way. Let that be our day now. Lord, we pray for revival. Revival of our hearts. Revival of our spirits, of our strength. Revival for our communities. Lord, that people will turn, whether it's turning back are turning to your message of hope, healing, and redemption. Father, I pray that you begin to equip us right now, even now, for this calling ahead as we find a new way forward as a church, Lord, as we pray together, as we seek you together. Move in a powerful, powerful way, Father. Thank you for all those that are watching online, God. I pray that you bless them in a powerful way today. May your spirit be known in their hearts and in their minds. Thank you for those in the room. Jesus, we love you great king. And in your name we pray. Amen. 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 I'm so glad that you joined us. Make sure you come back next week where we're going to talk about uh, these things in a little more detail about how they're going to look. I'm so excited for this. Make sure you're here for that next week online or in person at both of our campuses. Love you guys. See you then.